if you really want to discover aliens, and some of us really do, I mean, a lot of us do, Abby included, right? Like, then we have to sit down and we have to really think rigorously about the problem and develop theories that we can test. Can assembly theory discard like irrelevant or low value information? For example, people talk about water, you know, oh, we found water on Mars and there's evidence of, I'm like, of course, you know, hydrogen is the most common element. Oxygen is like the fourth most common. Of course, you're going to find a lot of water. Um, you know, so in other words, is that, you know, finding water, is that, is that dispositive? Is that in any way, or is can you just exclude it? Cause it's so abundant. It's, it's, it's almost like a nuisance parameter. Yeah. So, um, so assembly theory is falsifiable. Like if you found a high assembly thing and you couldn't associate it to life, you can falsify the theory. But I think one of the things is it's trying to get rid of all those kind of details. Um, and the water argument is more of one of habitability than life. Right. So, so there has been traditionally also in astrobiology, this confusion between talking about the components of life as life, right? So that's like, you know, these single molecules become represent like oxygen. Oxygen is not life. Oxygen could be a signature of life with a whole set of other assumptions associated to it. Um, and uh, DNA is not life either. DNA is evidence of life because it's high assembly object. It requires a lot of design and evolution. Oxygen is kind of, so you can see where those fall on in sort of an assembly structure. But things like water are preconditions for life, right? Assumed preconditions based on what we know of life on Earth. So life on Earth requires water. Therefore, we go look for environments with water because we assume that life couldn't exist in the environments that don't have water. So it's kind of like we're trying to screen out the search space um, and focus it in. But um, but assembly theory is kind of agnostic to that because it just says you need to have an environment that life could emerge, whatever environment that is, and and that um, and life could build complex things, and then you would look for those complex things. Now it might be that some environments life doesn't build complex things and they're below the assembly threshold, um, but there are also ways that we can detect features of selection or light of information processing below that that we're still developing. So. Interesting. Um, and then what did you make of this, uh, this conjecture by, uh, by Avi Loeb that, you know, the universe was once, uh, you know, at, at age, you know, at the re at a redshift of 100, the universe was approximately room temperature, meaning that you could have a liquid water, um, and actually over a wide variety of time scales. And uh, so liquid water was, was per perhaps abundant in the, you know, just ambient universe. Uh, does this, does that play a role, you know, cosmic connect? I'm trying to push back the last, what I want to do is push the last common Luca back to the last scattering surface. So uh, I want to get it closer. Well, I, understand. Um, I just don't see the utility. I mean, yeah. what, what does that give you? It just, yeah. it gives you an interesting thing to say. I think it's curious. I think there could be something there, but do, do I follow the chain of logic to say, oh, I have observational signatures of life living right. in that period of the universe and I haven't seen anybody actually go that far. So, I mean, I can spend all day making wild conjectures about what life, what could be life and where it could be in the universe. I have a million ideas a day about it, but I think the thing is like, if you really want to discover aliens and some of us really do, I mean, a lot of us do, Abby included, right? Like then we have to sit down and we have to really think rigorously about the problem and develop theories that we can test and things that we can do in the lab, observations we can make with telescopes and theory that we can build. And those three things have to work together just like mm -hmm. they do in, in physics. But astrobiology hasn't transitioned because it's, not a mature science yet. It's a really new field and it's bringing together a lot of areas of science that haven't worked together before. Yeah. We don't know how to ask the question of life. We, we make a lot of assumptions that we know what we are. And, um, and you know, the, we, we I'll know it when I see it is so pervasive. I'm glad that you brought that up earlier. It's funny, but it's true because people assume we're life. We know it when we see it, but yeah. So, so I think, I think, yes, it's fun. To, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's fun to talk about the water in the early universe and, and could it have been the case that life could have emerged really early in the universe, but I don't think it's helpful to any discussion about actually solving any of the problems that we're dealing with. Okay. Well, remaining on the Avi Loeb uh, bandwagon for a second. Uh, so he's had, uh, you know, kind of a, a lot of um, maybe dissonant Con conflicts with uh, the astro astronomy community, but primarily, you know, what, what he's advocating for is that we spend all this money on, on you know, kind of wasteful science, string theory, and and you know, bigger and bigger accelerators and so forth. But what we sh really should be studying is not even spending it on SETI, which is like information, um, looking for uh, techno signatures in the you know, radio wave or light waves, 
Uh, and as I mentioned before, they really pivoted from, you know, the pure core mission that they had from Drake's time until, you know, and Morrison until today, which is looking for extremophiles and, and all sorts of other, you know, life on Earth at Redshift Zero. Um, but what do you make of his claims that sort of, you know, we should be looking for physical, you know, techno signatures like like this little chunk of Oumuamua that I captured uh, not too long ago going across my, my – uh, but but tell me, what are your thoughts about this? You should Have make you- that into an NFT. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I have been actually. I did get approached by somebody who does is making NFT meteorites, and I'm just like, oh. all right. Well, don't look down. Don't look. Good. Um, well, tell me, what do you think about a muamua? I don't think I've um, asked you this before. Yeah. So I think some of the features of being open minded and realizing that aliens could be right in front of us and and it might just pass us by are really um, good about the way that Abby is approaching some of these questions. Um, but I think in the case of um, um, I can never pronounce this one either. Um, oh, um, mua mua. Um, mua mua. It's not. Um, it's not marinara. I was going to make I it. Think this is one like you could run the whole Bayesian thing we just talked about, and there are really good models, actually, including developed by one of my colleagues here, uh, Steve Dasha at ASU, that explain um, mua mua in terms of completely natural um, explanation, including some of the anomalies that um, Abby talked about in his book, like they've been basically like all of these sort of features. Um, So I I think there's a lot of evidence that, you know, suggests it could have a natural origin and it's not an anomaly. Um, Now, the real issue, I think, is not um, 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 and the debate around that, but the whole issue of are anomalies adequate to assign alien as the explanation? Mm -hmm. And we do this everywhere. We do it in UFO science. We can't explain it. It's aliens. Amuamua, we can't explain it. It's aliens. Uh, Biosignature science, phosphine on Venus, we can't explain it abiotically. It's aliens. Saucers, Um, yeah, saucers. Yeah, so I I think... I think culturally, Mm -hmm. culturally, and this is ubiquitous across scientists, members of the public, everyone, aliens right now are the other. They're the explanation for things we can't explain. Mm -hmm. And I just don't feel like that's adequate. I don't, I think if we don't understand what something is, we should say it's an anomaly. If we have a mechanism and we can explain it, and that mechanism happens to be associated to the phenomena we call life, Mm -hmm. and we can say this is an example of life that's not us, then we use the alien hypothesis. Right. But it's not science if I'm just saying everything that I don't understand is alien. Um, what about my your former colleague and uh, you know Paul Davies and current colleague also? Uh, you know, talks about the shadow biosphere. Right on the other side of the hall. Oh, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah, <laughs> I could knock on the door. Yeah, yes. um, you know, the shadow biosphere and these lurkers in our solar yeah. system. And as he wrote about, it, I pointed out to him. You know, we've done multiple interviews. One was on the eerie silence on the on the tenth anniversary of its publication, which was itself on the fiftieth anniversary of the SETI program kicking off. Yeah, the silence has only grown more deafening in that realm. So. His his theory of you know shadow biospheres and so forth. Yeah. What do you make of that? Isn't that just kind of saucers by another by another name? Um, other by another name. Um, well, I think the shadow biosphere was intended to be a hypothesis to be tested, right? So the idea was, um, if life is not a singular event in the universe and it's common um, and it's common on earth-like planets the most earth-like planet is earth and we know the origin of life happened once here so maybe it happened twice and we just haven't actually recognized that yet um, and actually there's a lot of historical precedent for this because we have discovered alien life on earth that we didn't know about it just happened that we found out later it was related to us so for example you know for most of human history we didn't know microbes existed we had to develop the technology of microscopes to actually literally see that there were these organisms basically living in our bread and you know on the tabletop and pretty much everywhere around us but that was a completely hidden quote unquote shadow biosphere for most of human history and so the argument is um, if it's not DNA based life and we're only combing the seas like in Craig Venter's things, you know, going through the ocean, combing up life and, and detecting it based on DNA sequences, what are we missing? Um, and so, so Paul's very adamant that, you know, it's cheaper to look for life on Earth than it is to go look for life on Mars. So why don't we just have a concerted effort to look for an alien example of life on Earth that isn't actually alien to Earth, it's just alien to us because it's also originating on Earth. Um, and my personal perspective on it is that's a well-posed scientific question, and we should be doing that. I think from the philosophical side of how I approach the science and what's consistent with the kind of theories I do and the kind of work that my group has been doing, uh, thinking about the global organization of biochemistry and patterns in biochemistry, I don't think that you can have more than one example of life per planet. 
Um, and um, because I think life becomes a globally integrated system pretty quickly, and it's actually like a planetary scale process. And you can think about that even with modern technology and the global internet and how we're all increasingly connected. I just, I don't see, you think about life as, as information propagating and the kind of structure of it. I don't see the possibility of having more than one life form on the planet. But from the perspective of, is it a well-posed scientific question? Yes, it absolutely is. And it's, and, and I, and just to, I, I didn't mean to imply that like the, the whole set of biosignatures from UFOs to phosphine are not well posed. I just don't want, like, you need to have a conjecture there, like, about why is this life and actual, like, a theoretical support. Um, other way, like, I, I just, I don't understand the mentality. And maybe I'm just missing something, but I, I feel like there's more rigorous ways of approaching the problem that people have just shied away from historically because the life problem is so hard.